Good evening, everyone. Welcome viewers from all across the country via Zoom and Facebook. My name is Maureen Kelly Jonasson, and I am the Executive Director of the Historical and Cultural Society of Clay County in Moorhead, Minnesota. Before I introduce our esteemed speaker for the evening, I do want to, to give a special thank you to a member and donor, Dr. Yvonne Condell, for her support for our Black History Month speaker. As you listen to our presenter tonight, I encourage you to type questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Take a look for the Q&A box. Please do not use the chat for your questions. Instead, use the Q&A function. And you can type them in whenever they occur to you. So anytime throughout the talk, I will moderate the questions after Dr. Bay is done speaking. Dr. Bay is the Roy F. and Jeanette F. Nichols Professor of American History at the University of Pennsylvania and the author of The White Image in the Black Mind, African American Ideas About White People, 1830 to 1925 and to tell the truth, the life of Ida B. Wells. She is co-author with Waldo E. Martin and Deborah Gray White of Freedom on My Mind, a history of African-Americans with documents. Prior to joining the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania, she taught at and directed the Center for Race and Ethnicity at Rutgers University. An organization of American historians, distinguished lecturer, Dr. Bay will present Traveling Black, Buying Black, Race on the Road During the Jim Crow Era, which is based on research for her upcoming book, Traveling Black, A Story of Race and Resistance, due out this coming May. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much, Maureen, for that introduction. And, and thank you to the Clay County Historical Society for inviting me. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about my new book. Um, I would like to uh, share my screen with you because I have some good images. So just give me one second to get my PowerPoint up. So let me start out with a story. Um, when African-American minister Joseph K. Bowler traveled the south, south of the Mason-Dixon line during the first decades of the 20th century, he always brought along what he called a Jim Crow traveling kit. Its contents illustrate some of the practical obstacles that faced black travelers in the segregated South. The kit, which Bowler described to a reporter for the Chicago Defender in 1922, was designed to allow the minister who was a Massachusetts resident to travel through the South in relative comfort. It included a pair of soiled overalls purchased from an auto mechanic, a supply of salmon and other canned goods, a miniature gas stove, and a small tabletop about the size of a scrub board. Fowler would wear the overalls to avoid soiling his good clothes in the dirty Jim Crow coaches where white conductors and news vendors often spat tobacco juice on the seat and white farmers transported their chickens and hogs. But the key component of his kit addressed the distinctive geography, a distinctive retail geography that African-Americans were forced to negotiate when traveling Jim Crow. He carried food supplies along with his tabletop and stove to make sure he could make and eat his own meals. The dining car is a closed corporation as far as our people are concerned, he said. White people below the Mason-Dixon line maintain that we are animals, virtually camels, and can go without food and water for several days. Now, Jim Crow kits as elaborate as bowlers were likely rare, uh, but throughout the segregation era, African-Americans rarely hit the road without well-founded worries about where they would be able to buy food and other necessities. Moreover, such worries were not limited to the South or alleviated by the advent of new forms of transportation, such as long distance buses, personal cars, and airplanes. 
African Americans initially hailed the development of all these new forms of transportation as offering an escape from Jim Crow, but all would prove deeply disappointing. Both bus lines and airlines adopted forms of segregated seating, and even traveling by car did not guarantee Black travelers access to roadside accommodations of any kind, a problem that was also faced by those who travel by plane and bus. Indeed, rather than offering genuine alternatives to segregation, these new forms of transportation complicated the Jim Crow map navigated by Black travelers, adding new way stations where African-American travelers could find themselves unable to purchase food, drink, or other necessities. A distinctive feature of Black life during the segregation era, traveling Jim Crow shaped African-American perspectives on both mobility and consumption in ways that we have yet to fully recover and are in the danger of forgetting. Uh, the experiences of Jim Crow travelers dramatize the racial geographies in which both 20th century American social history and 20th century American consumer culture took shape. And they show how such geographies persisted, even as the changing technology of American travel made them increasingly difficult to maintain and all but impossible to navigate. Um, I explore these geographies and Black resistance to them in my new book, which is coming out next month from Harvard University Press. Here's the cover. Um, it's, it looks at the rise and fall of racial segregation on America's roads, buses, railways, airlines, and other travel services. Um, and it fleshes out a history of segregated transportation um, that has often been dealt with primarily in works that talk about the legal evolution of the Plessy versus Ferguson decision about railroad cars or the story of the freedom rides of the 1960s and other protests that finally actually did desegregate buses and other common carriers. These are subjects that my book takes up, but what I'm really most interested in recovering um, is the broad social history of segregated transportation, how it developed, how it was practiced day to day, the everyday resistance it engendered, and how it shaped Black struggles for civil rights. It's, an important, it's important to that story. Um, bitterly resented by Blacks, travel was a flashpoint for racial conflict and violence, as well as Black resistance and civil rights litigation. It mobilized Blacks across class lines because it was at once an affront to Black middle-class gender norms, uh, a leveling force that put all Blacks in the Jim Crow car, an inconvenience that made it hard for African-Americans to keep up with the demands of an increasingly mobile world and an unending offense to Black consumers whose travel dollars were really never equal. Um, my book discusses and explores these, all of these dimensions of the subject, but today I really wanna sketch out um, the broad outlines of the traveling Black story, largely with reference to consumption, a subject that offers a good illustration of the kind of detailed uh, history of travel segregation that my book recovers. Um, this subject, as others in the books, underscores that segregation, modern transportation, and modern consumer culture all grew up together. Um, although there was various forms of travel segregation that existed during the antebellum era, racial divisions on common carriers first become widespread during the golden age of American railroading, which extends from approximately the 1880s to the 1920s. Um, um, and these are decades that are also the high point in the history of Jim Crow. And in fact, railroad cars are one of the, among the first places where Southern state governments mandate, by, mandate segregation by race. Um, and the system of segregated seating, waiting rooms, roadside services, and um, other forms of a, a segregated accommodation that develop on the railroads do then provide the model for 
segregation that Black Americans will later experience traveling by bus, airplane, and automobile. The Jim Crow, I mean, there's a, there's a sort of complex history about the beginnings of segregation, which I really won't go into, but I will say that the Jim Crow car comes into its own at a time when Southern whites are really bent on drawing a color line that will effectively eviscerate the civil rights that Blacks gained during Reconstruction and reassert white supremacy. Prior to the 1880s, as I said, there was some racial segregation on trains, but it was uneven, largely informal, and usually consisted of conductors refusing to let Black passengers ride in what was known as the ladies' car, which was sort of the earliest distinction in railroad cars. Uh, ladies' cars were special cars set aside for women and their families, um, which had a variety of features that were designed to make rail travel more appealing to women, most important. They were the only place on the train where um, the smoking of cigars and pipes and other forms of tobacco was not permitted. Um, this is an era in which smoking is all but ubiquitous among, among men and women who don't don't smoke that much um, so that this is an appealing point for women. And then, if, and then if you look at the diagram at the bottom, um, the smoking car is kind of a smoking car in a couple of different ways because it rides directly behind the engine and if there's coal, the sort of tender that supplies it. So it often was a car where a lot of smoke from the actual train itself is ending up in the smoking car, um, which was also known as the, the forward. Um, so the ladies' car spared female travelers from exposure to either kind of smoke. They also offered amenities such as padded seats, um, ladies' restrooms, um, and uh, sometimes, um, you know, a sort of changing room for children. Um, and they they were uh, they were a success among women. Um, but as emancipation opened up the travel by rail to an ever-growing number of American women, uh, gender would prove to be an increasingly problematic sort of criterion for admission into this car. Middle-class black women and sometimes couples sought admission to the acts, admission to the ladies' car and when they were refused, they sued achieving enough success in the courts to inspire Southern states to begin to pass a series of colored or separate car laws uh, that would actually transform this system of gender segregation to a system of racial segregation. The new laws were designed to give segregation a more secure legal fitting, sitting, footing, excuse me, and required virtually no change in the actual facilities offered by, offered to black and white passengers. Instead, um, what had been the smoking car and sometimes the baggage car, as you see in this, in this diagram uh, would become the colored car. And this, I should add, would be typical of the kind of segregated facilities that African-Americans would end up with. They would always be substandard. This um, compar comparison photo from 1937 um, kind of shows the difference between a car for whites and a Jim Crow car on the same train. Um, and literally the Jim Crow cars were always older um, and had less comfortable facilities. In this particular case, this car, this, this car does not have air conditioning. It, um, it doesn't have uh, the big modern seats. It lacks a lot of the amenities uh, that the white car has. Um, so this set up the separate but equal that was then uh, vindicated in Plessy. Um, and this would remain the condition on American railroads. Um, Plessy, as you all know, was a kind of a challenge to this, which was then lost by black activists who hoped to um, overturn the new separate car law in Louisiana. They failed and instead the court ruled that um, accommodations could be separate but equal in a really sort of important decision uh, that set the precedent for a wide variety of municipal and state segregation laws maintaining separate but equal schools, toilets, restaurants, hospitals, hotels, theaters, and cemeteries. 
Ironically, given the case's origins, the separate but equal legal doctrine enshrined in Plessy had somewhat more limited application to travel segregation than it did to other forms of racial segregation. Its limits were largely honored in breach, uh, but it on actually only applied to the enforced separation as applied to the internal commerce within a state um, because the Supreme Court has no authority over the regulation of interstate commerce, which is in fact controlled by Congress. I mention this because this is one reason why travel would become a kind of central, uh, would be contested again and again in the courts by um, by black activists because the, the sort of grounding for interstate, the segregation on interstate transportation was in fact something that could be assailed in a court of law. Um, though it would take a long time for people to break, break it down. So with, with, the, with the Plessy versus Ferguson decision in 1896, um, the 20th century then opens with black travelers navigating a complex geography of formal and informal segregation that covers trains. Um, and then it begins also to cover not only trains, but you know where they ate, where they can buy. And all of this is very important, um, especially in traveling. Segregation was required by state law, not only on trains and other common carriers in the Southern states, um, but it was also required in things like dining. Um, when it came to dining, segregation's legal complications were compounded by the fact that railroad services were sometimes covered by both restaurant and railroad laws, which were not necessarily compatible or even complementary. Um, restaurants could be and were, were often either for whites or for blacks, uh, whereas Plessy versus Ferguson specifically mandated that railroads and other common carriers had to provide both black and white carriers with black and white passengers with separate but equal facilities. Um, just what that would look like was something on the ground that was sometimes covered by laws. Some states required separate entrances as you see in this cafe in Durham. Um, it wasn't specified with railroads, but um, railroads really struggle to figure out how to maintain any kind of separate facility. It was very difficult to supply dining facilities on the train, let alone something like the complexities of this cafe with separate entrances. Um, so what in effect happened is that none of the railroads would be willing to operate two dining cars. And instead they adopted a wide variety of ways of dividing up black and white diners uh, that ranged from excluding blacks from food services entirely um, to creating segregated seating within dining departments to seating African-American diners only after all other white passengers had finished eating. Um, on railroads, um, as elsewhere, separate was usually far from equal and the worst of these arrangements often prevailed. As a result, black travelers could never be entirely sure whether they would be able to purchase food when they traveled or under what circumstances. Uh, when black uh, journalist Thomas Fleming traveled cross country by train as a teenager in 1919, for example. He rode on a train where black passengers were not admitted in the dining car. His aunt and uncle who put him on the train seemed to have known this would be the case. They set, sent him off with a huge wicker basket filled with food, um, four days worth of sandwiches. Um, and during his journey, he noticed that black passengers did have also have the option of ordering food from the dining car, um, but um, it had to be delivered to them. They had to eat it where they were sitting and they were charged the same as white customers who got full table service. And this was another complaint that was very common about segregated transportation. Black passengers frequently got less service for the same money they rode in. They paid the same to ride in the Jim Crow car as whites did to ride in the more comfortable cars. They paid the same to eat terrible food. Um, this is something that black educator William Pickett also found out when he traveled from Lynchburg to Norfolk, Virginia in 1920. 
Um, he really couldn't get food or water. Uh, there was a dining car on his train, but it offered no service to black passengers whose only hope of food came when the train stopped in Petersburg for 20 minutes. Um, and um, they were offered some leftover food that could never be sold to white customers in an effort to get rid of it among the colored passengers. The food they sent, Pickens noted bitterly, only added indigestion to insult. For 75 cents, you could get a quarter of impenetrable dried hen fried the day before yesterday, old bread, and a slice of musty pie, whereas white passengers could get hot drinks, fried eggs for a few cents. So that's an illustration of the sort of inequality that really galled people. Um, and then when restaurant, when dining cars began to open up to black passengers as a result of a series of legal challenges, um, they did so on distinctly unequal terms. Um, they had a variety of arrangements, the last of, uh, one of the last of which was this arrangement where black passengers could sit um, in the dining car, but they had to sit behind a curtain. And if you look at the back of that photo, you see a curtain and a little compartment, and that would be where black passengers would be directed. Other options included sort of different, um, different seating times. Um, African-Americans who experienced these arrangements tended to find them truly humiliating. Um, Martin Luther King would say in his autobiography, the first time I was seated behind the curtain in the dining car, I felt like a curtain had been dropped on my selfhood. Um, it was kind of a revelation to him. He realized that he would never adjust to se se separate rating rooms, separate eating places, separate restrooms, partially because separate was always an equal and partially because the very idea of separation did something to his dignity and self-respect. Um, similarly humiliating was the sort of phase thing where blacks would eat later because um, the announcement that Negroes were now being seated in the dining car always came only after train officials had been seating whites for several hours. Um, not surprisingly, a lot of African-American travelers brought their own food rather than even try to eat in railroad dining cars. And also not surprisingly, Blacks were very eager to find alternatives to Jim Crow, welcoming each new form of transportation that emerged over the first half of the 20th century as an opportunity to invade the indignities of the colored car. So you see this with the advent of buses, for example, um, which start out as sort of large cars in the teens. Um, and these, and they're initially a municipal form of transportation that competes with the streetcars. And um, in many cities, especially in the South, um, Blacks form their own Jim Crow Jitney services in which, um, in which they would um, serve colored and usually white passengers as well. They were sometimes excluded from, they were, they were actually routinely excluded from white jitney services. Um, and, and they would hope, they hope to kind of create their own separate sort of transportation network. But in this, it, this, they just wouldn't have the kind of infrastructure or municipal funding to kind of do so. So buses would increasingly become um, an air arena in which blacks faced widespread discrimination. Um, this becomes evident as early as the 1920s when there's an expose in the Chicago Defender that reveals that some bus lines refuse to carry African-American passengers, while others carry only small numbers. Um, the story is broken by Albert Liberty, a white journalist who researched it by posing as a white passenger who was reluctant to travel next to people of color and was told by one bus company official that we sit the N word in the back was told by another that we never ever under any circumstances sell tickets to Negroes. Um, others told him that they sold only a very limited number of tickets to either blacks or Mexicans. 
um, and told most people who wanted tickets that they were all sold out. So there were all these different ways um, that bus companies discouraged black passengers during the early um, years of bus company service. Uh, so many that actually the NAACP um, and other civil rights organizations had to challenge these practices. Um, and um, aside from racism itself, bus companies were eager to discourage black customers because they often actually did not have roadside services that served black passengers. Um, uh, at Shoreline Bus Company, which discouraged black passengers um, also um, didn't really have anywhere for that. They didn't permit them to get off the bus. Um, they had to kind of agree to stay on the bus for the entire trip. And this included on an 11 hour trip that had three or four scheduled stops in which white passengers could seek refreshment and comfort. First, oh, as a result, some black entertainers like Ma Rainey would end up getting their own buses. Duke Ellington, a lot of the other jazz greats ended up with their own buses. And this is one of the ways that they would kind of avoid Jim Crow. Ma, Ma Rainey is very early here. We see a picture of her bus in 1927. Um, first available, though not all that useful in the 1910s and 20s, automobiles um, offered a far more attractive alternative to African-American customers who wanted to avoid travel in Jim Crow. Um, as early as 1924, Atlanta's Black newspaper, The Independent, was encouraging readers to buy a car of your own and escape Jim Crowism from the streetcar service. Uh, likewise, Arthur Raper's study of um, Blacks in rural Georgia found African-Americans using automobiles as a way of breaking away from the irritations of unequal transportation facilities, a finding confirmed by later investigators who visited black communities across the South. However, cars were beyond the means of many black travelers um, and never even allowed well-to-do blacks to fully escape segregation. Um, for all that some claim that effective equality could be achieved at 25 miles an hour, driving presented a variety of problems, both old and new. Um, in the Jim Crow South, um, Jim Crow etiquette could extend even to the rules of the road. Um, according to historian Gerard Packard, at many four-way intersections in the South, in the early days of automobiles, the right of way was determined not by who reached the intersection first, but rather by the race of the drivers. Um, and when confronting a white driver who was female, black male drivers sometimes faced a life or death decision. Uh, passing white drivers was also problematic in Mississippi, local custom uh, forbade black drivers from overtaking white drivers on unpaved roads, lest they sort of kick up dirt in their face. And this really surprised me. Um, throughout the South, parking was often subject to segregation. And here's one picture of um, a, a direction to colored parking. I've seen other pictures of parking lots outside workplaces. And again, it's sort of like the best parking is preserved for whites. So African-Americans negotiate this system in which um, they're encountering these kind of limitations in almost everything they do. Um, their most ubiquitous challenges um, in, in traveling by car as by train really come to consumption. Traveling any distance by car for all that we think of it as something you do that gives you independence. It requires stops for food, gas, and accommodation. Um, and it would take African-Americans out of their own communities into terrain where they could never be quite certain what kind of retail discrimination was in force. Um, they were not always sure, and this was another thing that surprised me, they were not always sure they'd be allowed to buy gas at service stations in Southern states um, and some Northern as well, um, and reported that some stations do not want us to buy gas or oil. An example of retail racism, such slights had an economic rationale. Black consumers were far from the first 
uh, the primary target of the service station that industry that developed alongside the automotive industry. Instead, um, oil companies faced with the challenges of selling largely indistinguishable products uh, such as motor oil and gasoline, uh, sought to create welcoming home-like environments um, that would ensure consumer loyalty in an era when most car owners were white and many, um, many people in the automotive industry were um, eager to court female business. Um, and you see that, uh, especially starting in the 20s, all the big, um, gas and oil companies start building these kind of English style cottage stations complete with chimneys, gabled roofs, shuttered windows and their trade magazines have articles that say things like dress your station up with flowers. Here is how to go about it. Um, one of Shell's advertising campaigns uh, emphasized that its stations were home clean and that they had a white patrol of 48 inspectors uh, traversing the country, making sure the facilities were spotless. Unfortunately, the kind of domestic ideals uh, that the white patrol police were white, blacks had little or no place in the sheltered home-like environment that these early service stations sought to create. Um, accordingly, even when they could buy gas, uh, Black customers were often barred from using the lunch counters, soda fountains, and restaurants in service stations. In the South, these kind of prohibitions were um, imposed by law, but such arrangements were not uncommon elsewhere. Um, at the, the restaurant at, the Stan, at Standard Oil's Myers Station near Joliet, Illinois, for example, um, greeted travelers with a large, we do not cater to colored sign until 1948 when Illinois state representative uh, Cornel Davis finally persuaded them to have it removed. So whereas white travelers during this time period often return from long car trips talking about the pleasant incidents connected with their travels as one black writer wrote, Black travelers came home with memories of the Jim Crowism that they encountered on at rest stops and service stations. Like African American travelers, such as the minister Joseph Bowler, black drivers learned to assemble Jim Crow kits before driving any distance. They loaded up their cars with food, water, maps. Um, which they carried so they did not have to stop and ask for directions. They also brought along amenities such as toilet paper and pecans on the assumption that they might not be able to use roadside restaurants. Some even filled their gas tanks before they left home and put additional gas in the back of their car um, so they wouldn't have to stop for gas. And they tried to time their trips to make any kind of any stop for gas in major cities. This all gave black travelers an unusual travel experience, um, which is most, um, um, comes across most clearly in a story that African-American historian John Hope Franklin told looking back on a trip that he made from Charleston, South Carolina to Raleigh, North Carolina on December 7th, 1941, the day of Pearl Harbor. Um, although, the day that the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. The attack was broadcast shortly after 2 p.m., but that day, Franklin and his wife, Aurelia, knew nothing about it until they arrived in Raleigh in the evening. Their car had no radio, and like most Black families motoring through the Jim Crow South, they had packed a box lunch to avoid the humiliation of being turned away and were relieving themselves on roadside ditches because service station restaurants were closed to them. So they drew, drove in sort of a surreal bubble where they did not know what was going on. The challenges faced by the Franklins and other African-American drivers gave rise to a series of guidebooks. Um, if those of you have seen the movie, The Green Book, will know about The Green Book, but one of the interesting things things to note is that the Green Book is neither the first or the last of these kind of guides. There were a whole bunch of them. Hackley and Harrison seen here is the first of them. 
Uh, there were others included Grayson's Guide, the Go Guide to Pleasant Map Motoring and Travel Guide. Um, and all of, they, they differed um, in some ways, but all of them kind of performed the same function of trying to guide black travelers to places where they could be welcome. Hackley and Harrison's um, was the brainchild of Edward Edwin Hackley, a lawyer and journalist, and Sarah Harrison, who was the secretary of the of Connecticut New London's uh, Negro Welfare Council. Um, and it opens with a illustration of the services it provides that makes reference to W.E.B. Du Bois, who had actually written Harrison. Uh, looking for a place to stay when he was traveling through New England. Um, he, uh, he had gotten her name from a friend uh, who lived in New Haven. And what we see in the whole anecdote is that even someone like Du Bois, who's very, at that point in his life, you know, well-known, highly regarded, he cannot get in a car and drive somewhere and simply assume that he'll be able to find a place to stay. Instead, by the time he writes Harrison, he's already been circulating inquiries about colored boarding houses in New London to someone else. Um, and he's just sort of having to write several letters to go anywhere. And when you look at what the entries are and things like Hackley and Harrison's, you see how difficult it was how to find some of these places. Um, it did list hotels, but a lot of the list, its listings were for rooms, just sort of, um, individual individuals who had an extra room that they could stay with. So this guide tried to help help people locate such rooms. It was short-lived. It came out just as the just just um, on the cusp of the Great Depression and um, Harrison died shortly after it was published. So uh, after 1930 it did cease publication. but subsequent guides would prove more enduring. We have of course the Green Book. Um, which was published regularly for almost 30 years. It started in the 1930s um, and it was established by Victor Green, a New Jersey mailman um, who ran it with his wife and brother. He modeled it on a couple of different publications. One was the Automobile Green Book, which was a road guide to the East Coast. And the other was New York City's organized Cash Rough Laboratories Kosher Food Guide, uh, which was designed to serve um, the observant Jewish community who wanted to uphold dietary laws, um, but in addition to listing packaged goods, it also enumerated hotels, summer resorts, and camps that cater to Jewish travelers. The Green Book combined features of both of these publications. It listed not only hotels, but also places like uh, nightclubs, uh, barber shops, drugstores, anywhere where um, Victor Green or other company members had found that people were welcoming to blacks. Um, so, and then other subsequent ones include Grayson's Guide, which was directed at business travelers and Travel Guide, which started in 1947 and ran for about a year. Its motto was vacation and recreation without hum humiliation. All of these sought to help people in various ways. Um, Travel guide also included information on the civil rights laws of each state, trying to get give people a sense of what they could and could not do. Um, however, even when they employ these kinds of guides, African Americans still found road trips difficult um, and potentially dangerous. Uh, John Williams, the the writer, used travel guide to draw to drive cross country in the mid 60s and found some of the accommodations he was directed to unhabitable. Um, after arriving in yet another dilapidated hotel in Jackson, Mississippi, he had coffee in what he called its dingy little dining room and rushed out overwhelmed by the place. Segregation, he wrote, has made many of us lazy, but it's also made many of us rich without trying. No competition, therefore take it or leave it and you have to take it, the slovenly restaurant keeper, the uncaring hotel man, the parasites of segregation only provide superficial utensils for her, their dismiss. Um, 
More problematic was also that often the information in these guides was not necessarily up to date or accurate um, in the same way that we often find information we find on the internet not entirely accurate. It was actually worse, obviously, in these print publications. So with these driving difficulties, it's not surprising that flying, which became an increasingly common form of civilian travel after World War II, was initially welcomed and hailed as a decisive escape from Jim Crow. Air travel will squeeze Jim Crow out of, transportation, of, out of the transportation system in this country, predicted African-American Air Force pilot William Ellis in 1945. There's, there's not enough room in the air for back seats. People will simply have to travel closer together. Um, but Ellis, who also anticipated that he and other African-American airmen would be hired to fly planes, proved overly optimistic. The first African-American pilot was not hired until 1963, and only after African-American pilot and Air Force veteran Marlon Green win, won a landmark um, Supreme Court case against discrimination in the airline industry. And discrimination also applied um, to passengers on planes. Most of airplanes early routes were interstate. Um, so segregation on board airplanes was really never legal, but various forms of Jim Crow nonetheless occurred. Scattered evidence suggests that in the early days of flying, um, some airlines simply refused to carry black passengers at all. So for instance, when African-American clarinet player William, Wilton Crawley was told by the United Artists Com Theater to fly to El Paso, fly from Texas to Los Angeles to play in one of its productions, Crawley was initially unable to buy a ticket. He was informed that the company drew color line and it was a challenge that he was ultimately able to overcome by putting on a turban and traveling as a Hindu gentleman carrying a clarinet case. And this is something that um, Blacks sometimes did to escape travel segregation if you could persuade people that you were part of some other group of color like um, South Asians or sometimes uh, Latin Americans, uh, you would ex be exempt from some Jim Crow regulations. Um, this kind of outright exclusion gave way by the 1940s, but it was replaced by various systems of segregated seating. For instance, the Chicago and Southern Airline admitted in 1945 that it practiced Jim Crow seating on its Dixie bound flights. It is true that Negro passengers are requested to sit on the forward seats of the airplane. An official for the airline wrote to Theodore Allen, a black federal official, um, and government employee who had protested after he had been moved to the front of the plane and separated from the white man he was traveling with. Um, the airline's representative was unapologetic about the practice and instead maintained that from the point of view of personal comfort, these forward seats are the most desirable seats on the aircraft. Um, and that uh, Negroes were being offered accommodations and facilities that were equal or superior to those offered by other passengers. Uh, black travelers often chose to disagree, especially when they were forced to move and it's forced to um, not travel with a white travel companion if they were traveling with someone else. Um, by the 1950s, however, this practice seemed to have given way to less obvious forms of segregation. Um, Prior to 1951, when a former employee successfully challenged the practice in New York courts, American Airlines would use a secret code to ensure that, a, that its small number of black passengers were seated in the same row of a plane. Um, and likewise, several airlines trained their phone operators to identify Negro voices, as they said, in order to assign them specific seats on specific flights. Blacks who braved the largely white world of flying um, encountered other indignities as well. Uh, they tended to be first in line for any kind of travel disruption. They were sometimes bumped to make room for white passengers. This actually happened to Ella, Fitz, Ella Fitzgerald when she was traveling from San Francisco to Sydney, Australia for a concert. She was traveling with her accompanist and secretary seen here in this photograph. Um, and when they got when they they got off the plane in Honolulu, when it stopped to refuel, 
Um, and they were just simply not allowed to reboard, not even to retrieve their clothes and other personal items that they had left behind in their seats. Um, instead, they were stranded in Honolulu for three days. Um, they had been bumped to make room for white passengers. Um, and she missed her concert uh, and ultimately sued. Pan American Airlines tried to complain, tried to claim that they had been bumped through inadvertence. Uh, but Fitzgerald won. She received $7,500 in damages. Other slights experienced by black passengers um, included segregation on the ground. Um, Congressman Charles Diggs, Charles, Michigan Congressman Charles C. Diggs, who was an early flyer, um, was one of the many African American travelers who was sort of disappointed, initially excited about and then disappointed by flying. Um, he initially thought that he was going to escape old patterns of segregation and discrimination established on railroad and bus lines, um, but he was soon disappointed to find undemocratic practices common in air, airports, as he reported in a 1955 letter to the president of Continental Airlines. Specifically, what he finds is that there are colored waiting rooms. The arrow in this photograph is pointing to a colored waiting room. There's colored um, the separate restrooms and water fountains. Um, there's also, and this is particularly difficult for air travel, there's uh, segregated cabs. So blacks who had decided to fly so they could move very quickly from one place to another would then sometimes be unable to get a cab at the airport because cabs in the South were typically um, served whites or blacks. And um, in many cases, there were very few cabs serving blacks um, coming to the airport. Uh, Diggs succeeded in pressuring Harry Truman to desegregate the federally owned Washington National Airport as early as 1948, but other facilities were slow to follow suit. The complete segregation of American airports would not be accomplished until 1963 after a long series of public protests as well as Department of Justice lawsuits. Likewise, um, many months of freedom rides, federal pressure and a Supreme Court order would be required to bring about the 1961 desegregation of interstate buses and bus stations in the South. Uh, while segregation remained in effect in many roadside restaurants and hotels until well after the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964. As all these examples show, travel segregation would prove difficult to overturn um, despite su the sustained opposition it generated among blacks and the shaky legal ground upon which it stood, as well as the complications that it imposed on travel uh, on transportation related businesses that had to come up with these kind of double facilities. Um, invented on the ground as well as in the courts, travel segregation had deep roots in regional customs and also in the travel industries in which it was practiced, whose proprietors often saw it as a commercial necessity. Indeed, in the book, Sharing the Prize on the Economics of the Civil Rights, movement, Gavin Wright, who's an uh, economic historian, Gavin Wright suggests that the segregation of public accommodations was fundamentally a business policy by profit seeking firms. Um, after all, it was practiced um, not only by Southern businesses, but also by national host hospitality chains and commercial carriers that observed segregation on their Southern routes, um, as well as by Northern businesses that did not welcome Black customers. Uh, the owners of all such businesses, right, suggests, um, segregated their services at least in part because they feared that serving Blacks, particularly in socially sensitive activities such as sleeping and eating, would result in the loss of white customers. In other words, travel, if traveling Black was a deeply demeaning inconvenience for Blacks, traveling white was an amenity that business owners believed was highly valued by white customers. Offering better service to African-American customers might have held potential profits, but such customers were rarely seen as valuable enough to offset the white business that they might discourage. And the second class 
services offered to Black customers could be very profitable. African-American customers provided a lucrative market for the common carriers, worst seats, leftover food, and other substandard travel goods and services. So in the end, it would take not just the interstate not just interstate commerce commission rulings and changes to federal and local laws to desegregate roadside race and retail, but also sit-ins, freedom rides, boycotts, and other forms of protest that threaten the economic well-being of segregated establishments. The colored car over time was an artifact not only of Southern segregation laws, but also of a national travel industry that encouraged whites to um, whites to see train compartments, seats on common carriers, and even filling stations as safe, home-like spaces where Blacks and other people of color were either not committed or relegated to separate and inferior accommodations. Not just required by law in many Southern states, travel segregation was promoted by many businesses in, these, in, in this region. Um, they marketed their whites only facilities as clean, safe and superior to less exclusive accommodations as can be most graphically seen in this sign from Lexington County, uh, South Carolina, which is advertising for um, Gulf, a Gulf station um, in, in terms that really promote segregation as one of its assets um, and suggest that racial ex exclusivity uh, stands in for the concrete provision of superior services. So little wonder then that civil rights activists such as Ella Baker would insist that retail racism was about something bigger than a hamburger. For Blacks during the segregation era, such racism was an inescapable mark of second-class citizenship. Never limited to the South, retail racism could be found on common carriers and public accommodations across the country. And it affected black congressmen, celebrity and ordinary folk alike. Moreover, if Jim Crow travel practices made white travelers feel much more at home in the world, they had the opposite effect on African-Americans. Black travelers often confronted unanticipated difficulties and painful embarrassments that underscored their limited rights as consumers and as citizens. For them, travel was never associated with the freedom celebrated by white bards of America's open road from Walt Whitman to Jack Kerouac. African-American travelers instead confronted an uncertain road, never quite sure of what kind of welcome to expect, they were not always able to purchase the most essential goods and services needed by anyone far from home, such as food, drink, and accommodations. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions and I will stop my share. We have many, many questions, I have to tell you. Um, we, have an we have inquiring minds. That's great. Um, are you familiar with uh, Candace Taylor and Gretchen Soren's books? And, sure, and I what am. ways do, um, does your work differ? Um, I focus on a sort of longer stretch of time and more um, vehicles. Um, both Candace Taylor's book and Gretchen Soren's book focus above all on automobiles. Soren's book is called Driving While Black. Um, and uh, Hannessy Taylor is really, it's focused also on driving. I was really interested in, in sort of, I actually start to some degree with stagecoaches and steamships. I was interested in exploring the ways in which segregation and transportation kind of start together and the ways in which segregation moves from one form of transportation to another, which was very much in part of how African-Americans were experiencing it. Um, African-Americans were always making sort of choices. Am I gonna drive? Am I gonna fly? Which is gonna work better for me? So I wanted to sort of capture the entire world in which blacks were traveling. And I also thought it was important to really emphasize things like trains and buses because um, African-American levels of car ownership are historically lower than white levels of car ownership. So for much of the segregation era, most black travelers would not actually be traveling by car. They would be traveling by train or bus. And that kind of leads into the next question. Were some railroads, Railroad companies more notorious than others? Did 
Uh, did folks avoid certain routes? Um, were there some that were more usable or user friendly? Um, to some degree, um, I, they were notorious for interesting things. Like um, the Pennsylvania Railroad was notorious for segregating, putting blacks in the colored car as far north as New York City. Um, so, and, and there was also a, a Chicago Railroad that would sometimes do that as well as a California Railroad that would that would do it. Um, and, and in the Deep South, segregation was pretty much uniform across the railroads, but perhaps worse in some states and others. Blacks particularly hated traveling in Texas. I don't think it mattered what railroad, it was simply that Texas was so big that you could, you know, you would you could travel in a Jim Crow car and have to sit upright in a wooden seat for 30 hours at a time. And also in a car without air conditioning, because these two things were likely to happen in a Jim Crow car. And so that's uh, sort of uh, interesting. What the, one question was on the, the geographical air, uh, area. Um, mm -hmm. Are we talking the eastern seaboard to Texas um, or uh, the Gulf to the Mason-Dixon line? What was the territory involved? The Mason-Dixon line was, was the cutoff point for the most part. Um, buses often would segregate beyond those spaces, um, but they would also sometimes, I mean, there would be court cases in which black travelers would sometimes win, but the Mason-Dixon line was the point at which um, black travelers would have to move to the Colored car, Washington was what was known as a big chain station. So was Cincinnati. Um, uh, I can't remember what the Texas station was. So it, it was sort of the boundaries of the South, but it was also, you know, also that wasn't always true. There were, were, were companies that would sort of for convenience decide that Blacks had to ride in the colored car well before they actually reached this boundary. Um, Langston Hughes, uh, in one store, in one of his articles, talks about being put in the colored car in Los Angeles when he's going to Louisiana. So these kind of things did happen. Um, did colored only mean that whites did not have the right to dine there? They they would actually face consequences for for dining or, or uh, shopping in uh, colored only establishments? Um, that could vary. One thing it, it, it didn't, I mean, in, especially like in Jim Crow cars, colored cars on the railroad, whites routinely sat in them and would never face any kind of consequences. I know that in one of the pictures I showed you, there was a um, what looked like a, a, either a store or a bar that sort of said, colored only by police order. order. I, I think in some restaurants or, and especially things like dive bars, there was a real attempt to keep whites out of perhaps some colored spaces. But in general, it was a kind of two way, it was in general, it was not an egalitarian relationship. Whites routinely went into the colored car, whites went into black restaurants. It was blacks who were not allowed to use white facilities much more often than the other way around. Okay. Um, we've seen in movies and books, specifically musicians and baseball players segregated. Were there any other occupations that were particularly targeted? Um, any kind of thing where you're traveling. So, um, I mean, it's not so much they're targeted, but they are mo they're moving around in this segregated world. So they're encountering segregated transportation. Um, so this, this occurs for um, a lot of black leaders um, who sort of address national audiences. They travel across the country. They encounter a lot of segregation. Uh, black federal officials um, found it particularly difficult because Washington was often segregated or if, if, they, if they went south of Washington, they would be segregated. Um, so any kind of profession in which blacks experience mobility, they would, they would encounter all these kind of things. And musicians in particular, because they traveled a lot, encountered a lot. Some of the travel guides were actually established by musicians. Uh, for instance, the magazine Travel Guide, which I showed you was uh, established by Billy Butler, a musician, uh, Victor Green, one of his brother-in-law was a musician. Some of these guides had their roots in kind of informal lists kept by musicians. Mm 
everything. Um, is it possible to pre-order your book online? Absolutely, you can you can pre-order it on Amazon. I think also the press is taking orders. So yes, please please pre-order it. Great. Um, what a couple of people asked this: What comparable treatment did uh, other non-white uh, people races receive? Asian Americans, Native Americans, Latinx. You you kind of uh, alluded to that that sometimes people would would um, dress differently or, or try to be, uh, appear to be in a different racial category. Um, how yeah. are they treated them? Um, that's another really great question. And, and the answer is really complicated. One could actually write an, probably an entirely different book about it because it really varied um, by region. Like in Texas, for instance, Mexicans usually had to ride in the colored car that had to do a lot with the Texas economy and the way in which Texas had a lot of Mexican sharecroppers who tended to be treated more or less like Texas's black population. Um, but in Florida, for example, Hispanics were, um, which, was, which was sort of marketed itself as the gateway to Latin America and had a Hispanic population um, that included people of influence as well as commercial ties with Latin America, Hispanics weren't subject uh, to discrimination. So blacks in Florida, uh, such as uh, James Weldon Johnson, who would eventually had the, was it James Weldon Johnson? I think it was James Weldon Johnson, the writer um, would, um, would in, in encountering segregation in Florida, start speaking Spanish and avoid getting um, thrown into the colored car. Um, other people who kind of encountered this level of ambiguity were definitely South Asians. There were occasional diplomatic incidents in which traveling um, dignitaries or leaders from India and other places would be segregated. Um, according to most Southern state laws, it really was African Americans who were supposed to be the subject of segregation. So um, this is why you would have people doing things like donning a turban. And if they could convince people that they were not African American, this this ruse would work. Opposition to social equality was a big uh, part of the justification for segregation. Could you comment on? that in relation to gender and the treatment of black women in particular? Yeah, no, that's another really good question. Um, the opposition to social inequality and the way that this sort of, it, it all kind of mobilizes around these black women in the ladies car is really interesting. And it, it shows, I think, a kind of fear of social equality um, because part of what happens with the advent of travel segregation is you have respectable black men and women going into spaces that are sort of regarded as um, you know spaces for middle and upper class whites when train when train travel first starts you sort of bite you know if you're not actually walking you're probably a person of means um, so that early black travelers are kind of who are not actually there as servants for their, um, you know, for whoever they're traveling with are regarded as a sort of um, stark symbol of the ways in which blacks are somehow achieving some kind of social equality that whites find threatening. And um, this is one element of a lot of the early travel segregation. It is, it is really about, um, um, reestablishing the kind of social hierarchy that had traditionally existed between blacks and whites that went back to time, you know, but that sort of came out of a society in which black, most blacks were servants or slaves. Um, and as you move toward move towards emancipation, first in the North and then in the South, you begin to get these middle-class black travelers who are these sort of to whites, these sort of scary symbols of the ways in which um, blacks could be sort of overtaking whites or, or pulling even with them. And um, they're just kind of a specter of social equality that have to be discouraged. So how is the transportation treatment of, of blacks different in Northern states like Minnesota and the Dakotas compared to the South? Um, 
Minnesota had no kind of, you know, no kind of Jim Crow laws of any kind. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a relatively smallish history to my knowledge. I was kind of looking around to see if there was inc any incidents I could talk about in Minnesota and I couldn't find anything. There's, you know, there's not a large black population. Um, it, it, you know, what I did find and, and what was, what um, blacks during the segregation era did find is that um, segregation or this, or the ways in which blacks were unwelcome at things like hotels and restaurants occurred basically everywhere. And, and I would assume that Minnesota is in that category, but actually as a state, it did not generate a lot of complaints. Um, during this research, what was your most surprising discovery? Oh gosh, um, <laughs> there, I felt like each chapter I learned something that really surprised me. I was surprised by the segregated parking. I was like, really? Yeah. yeah. Really? You need to segregate parking. Um, I was also surprised by something I didn't talk about in this talk, but I do talk about it in the book. Um, I came across a lot of stuff about. Um, blacks dying in car wrecks. And it took me quite a while to realize that what was happening was not just ordinary train wreck fatalities, but what happened is that over the course of the segregation era, as they updated all the trains and began to use all metal passenger cars for all the good, you know, all the, all the first class cars and the whites only cars, they continued to use wooden cars for the Jim Crow cars. So what would happen around the turn of the century is when there were train crashes, which actually happens a lot around the turn of the century, you would have these train crashes where most of the people who died were black, um, you know, because what happened was that when the train crashed, um, the, the colored car would be sandwiched between the engine, which was made out of metal and the all metal white passenger car behind it. And it would just collapse like an accordion. So that was something, and that was something that um, black travelers and black journalists were very aware of, talked about, um, sent complaints about, but never got taken up by the government or ever officially acknowledged in any way. And it actually took me a while to even reference it. It was sort of so inside knowledge that it took me a while to even figure out what people were talking about. Uh, this may be beyond the purview of your work, but um, was this kind of racism practiced in any other countries than the US and, and South Africa? Um, never to the same extent. Um, and um, that was, that was, you know, at, at various points, I thought of doing a more international history, but one of the reasons I didn't was that um, Europe was often presented by African Americans who wrote about it as sort of the, the alternative where black travelers never encountered any segregation. That was not true. Um, that, and that was, I think, I, you know, that was sometimes made to make a political point. But the fact was that segregation wasn't systematic in Europe. It wasn't required by law. People had very different experiences. The same was also true of Canada. People traveling cross country would sometimes travel north of the border to escape segregation. Uh, the Niagara movement and early civil rights organizations met in Niagara Falls because they couldn't get a hotel on the, on the met in Niagara Falls, Ontario, because they couldn't get a hotel on the American side of the border. So yes, it did exist at, you know, outside the US and South Africa, but it was, I don't think as ubiquitous anywhere else. Um, were all the places that were welcoming uh, to black travelers owned by black people or, or would some whites also be allowed to, to serve African-Americans? Yeah, whites could serve African Americans if they cho chose to. And um, in fact, um, so, you know, where serving African Americans was profitable when, for instance, Blacks um, established profitable travel, res travel resorts or beach areas, you would often have white businessmen trying to sort of get in on it. So there was no, there was no kind of limitation on who could serve who. It just had, you just had to like follow, um, segregation rules and how you did it. Okay. Um, Blacks had the, the uh, Hackley and Harrison and the Green Guide and 
Uh, you mentioned um, a book for Jews. Gays and lesbians had the Damron's guide. Um, were there similar guides for other people of color, other groups that were facing discrimination, Asian people, for example, um, who wanted to find where they might find supportive people? Um, I have never seen anything for Asians who were, who were subject to similar discrimination, certainly in some areas. Um, but I think Asians were less, I mean, the a Asian, there, there were less Asians. And I, 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 as far as I know, and I've never seen or read about any guides for Asians. Okay. Uh, the photo of the dining car showed uh, an African-American waiter. Mm -hmm. How did or could they help African-American passengers um, agitate against Jim Crow? Well, that was, you know, that was challenging because what um, African Americans worked on the railroads in various capacities, they were waiters, a lot of them were Pullman porters. Um, sometimes they could help African Americans who were traveling, uh, waiters and other train workers would do things like, you know, serve food to people, sneak food to people, sometimes pr provide them places to sleep. But they were also sometimes charged with enforcing segregation, being the one to tell, you know, to tell black passengers that they couldn't go here or there, being the ones to kick people off the trains. Um, so they were in a in a difficult spot, and there's no sort of one one way that they did. Though I did see a lot of reports about people who were like snuck into a sleeping car by the Pullman porter and allowed to kind of, you know, spend the night there, you know. Um, you know, off the books. So um, it was it was a complicated relationship. Okay, and uh, the last question that we have in our box anyway is, are there any examples you know of, of companies or businesses that tried to integrate either due to their beliefs or to try to earn more money from black travelers? What was the result? Were there are businesses that tried to use the lack of availability of facilities for black travelers as a way to earn more money? Um, well, in the, in the early days of segregation, both the streetcar companies and the railroad companies actually did try to resist it because they were terribly afraid that they would have to run entirely separate vehicles for blacks. Like, um, what railroad companies were concerned about in the early days of segregation is that they would have to have first class cars for blacks, first class cars for whites, first, you know, second class cars for blacks, second class cars for whites. And likewise, uh, streetcar companies thought they would have to run two sets of streetcars and they were, they thought this would be prohibitive. In the end, they didn't have to do any of these things and they found that they could, you know, just sort of skimp on whatever they offered African Americans and they settled into that quite comfortably. Um, I'm having trouble thinking of transportation companies that really did try to take advantage of the black market. And it's, I mean, Greyhound would begin to market itself to black consumers after desegregation and also as it, be, as, as it lost a lot of its um, white consumers to car ownership, it would finally turn to a black market. But one of the striking things to me in researching this book is the extent to which a lot of businesses um, underestimated the sort of size of the black market or, or, or really thought that black people didn't have money and often actually sort of acted not necessarily in their own self-interest in terms of um, exploiting this market. Um, blacks tended to be somewhat underserved um, and um, I think Part of it had to do with almost like a sort of knowledge feedback. A lot of a lot of the decisions made by made about who to go after in markets was really made by people who were kind of thinking with their ideas about black people. And I think you still see this today. There's um, there's a lot of evidence about how you know things like high end supermarkets and stuff won't set up in black neighborhoods, even in black neighborhoods where um, you know where you have affluent consumers, because there's a, there's a way in which they're using algorithms algorithms that sort of conflate um, Black people with kind of inner city poverty. So I think some of that was actually going on in the earlier period as well. I know that uh, 
I learned a lot and I'm sure everyone here learned a lot. They certainly were engaged with lots of questions. We appreciate uh, people turn, tuning in from all over the country and we uh, really appreciate Dr. Mia Bay joining us for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.